Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Julia, for the invitation to, to give this talk. Is the microphone working okay? You guys can hear me? My voice is a little gone from uh, too many basketball games, I think. But uh, anyway, I'm um, going to walk you through some of the uh, experiences we've had over the last um, several years. I've been doing the Pollock assessment first in 1996, and I used to do lots of assessments, and I still kind of do. I don't do just this one. In fact, this is one of the easier ones. You know, there's harder ones than this that are much less important. Um, but this one is, is definitely fun to work on, and it's been a great um, ride to be over at the Alaska Center and have the opportunities that have been given to me. Um, anyway, I'm going to go through the uh, different things. And this, this is a kind of background history. This is a publication sheet I found a couple of years ago, and I found it again on my computer. And I thought it was really interesting because you know, it's, it's published in 41. And it talks about Alaska and fisheries. And, and the comment on Pollock was that it has a distribution similar to cod, equally abundant and of excellent quality. It's not fished commercially, and hence it's entirely wasted. Well, it's uh, quite, you know, the other thing that's interesting on this is that inside the document, the price actually hadn't, at the time I found it, changed very much. You know, it's been about the same price per pound uh, back then as it, is, as it is now. So we'll go into some of why that might be. Um, just to set, give you the setting, that was yesterday's weather. You can see the nice high over Seattle and good cold weather coming in. But uh, um, give you some perspective of the area that we're talking about. This is the eastern Bering Sea where the fishery occurs and coming into it. This, I liked it because you could actually see some of the, uh, the trenches and uh, <coughs> shelf and slope areas that are important for this fishery, even to the extent, although it doesn't show up, as you can see that the 50 meter or, uh, contour there, sorry, 100 meter contour for, for that. And uh, just coming in, one of the, the, the Russian borders just up in here, and just for, by way of perspective, the actual kind of land area is pretty similar to what you would get if you superimposed California on, on that productive area. So it's like uh, 50 meters. So good mixing oceanographically and has that. So it's a, it's a relatively large area, and that's, that's a, one thing that we want to take home. In terms of actual production, where it is in the world scheme of things, this is a, a, a time series of uh, world production of, of whitefish. I lost my title. Um, and how that's dropped with the collapse of a number of gadded stocks in other parts of the world, um, and what the prognosis is in, in, in the short term here, down around 6 million tons. Um, a large part of that is made up of Alaska pollock, shown here in yellow, which includes the Russian catches. But just for, from the North Pacific, we're producing almost half of the world's whitefish supply. Um, and just in terms of what the total catch is in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands um, of groundfish, this is kind of the, the historical takes of, uh, of again, groundfish. And you can see we exceeded 2 million tons back in the days of the foreign fishery and then where we've been with the combination over FCMA. Um, the part that's Pollock is obviously a large component. Again, uh, maxing out in the last five or six years at about 1.5 million tons per year. And you know, just by way of uh, giving some feel of what a 1.5 million tons of Pollock is and um, some of you will grow to, to hear these types of analogies, but um, if you took a, a football field, the dimensions of a football field, and put imaginary walls around it, you could pile in the Pollock until it would be about uh, 50 feet short of the Empire State Building. So that's just the volu volumetrically how big 1.5 million tons would look. If you stuck them end to end, each fish end to end, it would go around the world about 25 times. So it's a, it's a lot of fish, you know, to visualize and, and, and to see. So, uh, you know, you go to some of these uh, processing plants and, and things, and, and uh, it's, it's quite fascinating to see how efficient they are and how, uh, how, how it actually all works in a relatively efficient manner. So this slide is just going to be my little transition between different topics. I'm going to just talk about where Pollock end up. And uh, one of the most important things about where Pollock end up has to do with some marketing that's been done on them, which the industry's actually paid for. 
Just a couple of points on the Marine Stewardship Council, which many of you have heard of. Um, it was, uh, it, it's designed by Unilever so that they show that they can get a stable supply of product, which was a, a big seafood or big company at the, which had seafood as part of its um, products. And then uh, combined with the World Wildlife Fund, and they wanted, their interest was to change market forces to, to provide more reliable and sustainable systems. And in terms of uh, what, what the principles are that you have to do to get the certification, these are my snapshot view of it, is basically principle one is you must avoid overfishing. Two is you have to maintain the ecosystem at a healthy level. You can't have a fishery that's detrimental to that. And you must have an effective management system. That's my paraphrasing what those principles entail. There's, um, you go online, you can find the full, full wording for those. It took the Pollock fishery quite a long time, which is paid by industry, by the way, to get their certification. And um, we at the Alaska Center tried to help out as much as we could with that. And uh, it's had some big impacts on where things are going uh, in terms of entry into markets they didn't have before. Oops. But we did get the certification, and that's a scan of, of one of the ones that we did. Um, one of the big uh, products that they sell for, from Pollock is, is the row, and this is primarily going into Asia. And this is at a, actually at an auction that I was able to attend where they actually lay out, just like in Japan, they lay out uh, the products, the seafood, the fish, and whatever, and they have people coming through and writing in their bids on, on each lot of uh, of row and there's all different grades and here's a, here's a box of them where they package from a, a, a shore base plant up in Dutch Harbor and Mizuko just means the kind of grade that it is and what, where it will end up. In terms of uh, levels of, of row which is this is the really valuable part of Pollock the most valuable aspect the the increase in the overall catch that we showed in you know in the last five or six years has also it meant an increase in row, which is, means a lot more economically to the fishery. Um, one of the developments now with the American Fisheries Act, which I'll get into in a second, is that they now produce row on almost all the months of the year. And that's because they've been able to slow down and handle the fish more uh, efficiently and, and not have to worry about uh, racing for the fish. And they can actually pick and choose uh, places that they can fish and take advantage of, of the, the row and it may take more time in the process. Another big product of, of everybody should know about is, is Surimi. Pollock is a particularly high grade of Surimi. It's a fairly in, involved process and this was at, a, at one of the plants and this is kind of the end product and it, it, it looks kind of gross when it comes out but it's really an incredible thing you, you, to hold in your hand. It just It's like pure protein. It has no smell, no odor. It's like Play-Doh without even the Play-Doh taste, because I used to eat Play-Doh. <laughs> I, I didn't eat the surimi, though. Actually, actually, I did. It didn't taste like anything. And, and that's what it looks like uh, boxed up. And you, as you all know, that ends up as fake crab and things like that. Obviously, um, there's a big market for fillets, uh, fillets of, of uh, Pollock. And the, going through a factory, you see just incredible uh, processing uh, mechanisms to ensure good quality product. and and there's actually, a, along with this Marine Stewardship Council certification, there's a consortium of, uh, of Pollock producers, basically the fishermen, got together, all these companies, some of whom hate each other, uh, got together and, and want to put their best face forward on, on different products. And you'll recognize some of Andre's favorite things, a filet of fish and uh, some fake crab in here. That, that Pollock are, are made from and marketed locally or in the states. All right, that's all I have on product. I just want to get into uh, management. You all have heard that Alaska has a really good fisheries management system. It's called the Alaska model. It's often held up as a really good way to manage fisheries. And, and uh, I, I ask the question, well, why, why is it that it works so well in Alaska? And I think one of the key things is that uh, we were able to watch and observe, actually physically observe, how foreign boats came in and fished in our region before we declared the economic zone, and then um, actually learn how to catch the fish and then move into a fully domestic fishery as shown here. 
So, you know, excluding the foreign fishing really helped in terms of setting the stage for how best to go about management. Um, but also, there's other issues that were, the jurisdictions are relatively simple. We don't have a lot of states and federal issues, although for crab, that that's a, that's, can be an issue, but I'm talking about ground fish here. Um, you know, there, there's not a lot of um, multi-use like you get with salmon, all kinds of things like that. But also, I think it's pretty good that we have, a, have really good relationships between observers and, and you know, fishermen and stakeholders, you know, so it's, it, it generates a lot of cooperative research and uh, a good involvement in our surveys so that, you know, we don't get the situation that fishermen come to us and say often, um, what we see out on the grounds is nothing like what you're saying in your assessments or analyses. We have pretty good agreement, I think, because, you know, we, we have, have good communication and the lines are open. But, so we're an Alaska model. I, I wanted to talk about a fisheries role model. I mean, role model, and one of one of them is my friend Martin Dorn here. He's he's my role model. This is us at the auction, and I just wanted to go into what uh, what the model Alaska model actually looks like. Um, you know, we get criticized at least in in public press about being only using a single species management, but that's only one part of our whole system and. I just wanted to emphasize that what doesn't go noticed very often is that uh, this is the overfishing levels always got to be uh, the, the actual acceptable biological catch has got to be less than the overfishing level, and the TAC may be equal to the ABC or 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 less than, and same for the catch, and that's for all species. So the, the point there is that uh, we don't have a pollock fishery going on, catching lots of salmon catching lots of, we, uh, you know, without being counted. Everything's counted, and there's limits that are reached. They have to stop fishing for pollock. Um, you know, if there's a cod fishery going on that's catching, uh, reaching the limit on what they can take of other species, say halibut, then they have to stop fishing for cod. So it's not, it, the multi-species aspect of our management is is important uh, part, but, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing is that we don't want to uh, avoid, we, have any situation where we're overfishing a single stock, and that's what the combination of an observer program and our, our multi-species management uh, system in season works. Um, you know, we have lots of other management measures, uh, several closed areas. Um, you can see the whole southeast is closed to trawling. Traditionally, it used to be quite a popular fishing spot. Um, got all kinds of state water closures to non-pelagic pelagic trawling and, and crab closures to try to save uh, important areas for crab. And then we also have, this is the legend for, for the map on uh, stellar sea lion zones. And if you zoom in on, on these regions, there are all these uh, particular aspects of uh, stellar sea lion closures throughout the Bering Sea. Sorry, here's the Bering Sea, the Aleutian Island chain down there um, with different closure areas. So there's lots of area closures. There's also season closures. But probably the most important uh, in ground fish, and I'll touch on this towards the end of the talk, is uh, this 2 million ton, we call it now the optimum yield, the, which we're not allowed to exceed. So the TACs, which remember could be less than or equal to on a single species basis, are, um, have to add up to less than the 2 million tons. So in, in uh, that's... That's, a, that's kind of written in, in law, and all the tax have to add up to that. Well, if you add up the biological catch levels, so kind of the scientific single species based ABC values, in all these years they've added up to quite a bit more than 2 million tons. They've come down recently due to declines in pollock primarily, but uh, they're, they're all, all um, above that. So there's a, that's a big impact on our overall management system. And, Generally speaking, the ones that suffer are the ones that have dirtier bycatch issues. For example, flatfish fisheries, which catch a lot of halibut, do a lot of habitat destruction, they end up not having as much part of a uh, fraction of the overall quota, whereas pollock, since it's a relatively clean fishery, as I'll try to show, um, it, it generally, and it's valuable, tends to be one that's uh, targeted more than the others. In terms of a report card kind of on how we're doing compared to uh, kind of target levels, these are just the positions of, 
of what the catch was in 2006 relative to kind of the MSY level. So just a ratio to show that we're not fishing hard for any of those or at least over the MSY level for any of those species, at least based on our estimates. Similarly, the stock level in 2007 relative to their BMSY targets are all on one side. That was last year's kind of report card. If you move to this year, you could see, and I'll spend most of my time talking about Pollock, that we've dropped below kind of the BMSY level, but that's okay if it's a target. We're supposed to be below and above it half the time. So uh, one thing I'd also point out is you got a lot of flatfish here with very low levels of catch and high stock sizes, and I'll, I'll touch on that some more in a few minutes. Um, so one of the things that's also impacted our fisheries management is this thing called the American Fisheries Act. And this was really, uh, um, came into effect in a smoke-filled room, if you have to, when it comes down to it. Kind of went outside the council process, direct with the, the Senate and the legislature to come up with this, this bit of law, which basically rationalized the fishery. You know, eliminated the race by rationalization. It's kind of like an ITQ. It allowed the formation of cooperatives where uh, certain groups would be guaranteed a fraction of the quota. So they didn't have to have the race for the fish. And it is quite specific to the Bering Sea Pollock fishery in so much as that it names something like 21 boats that will participate in this. And or only these 21 boats that could do it. Uh, as I mentioned, it improved the efficiency. It made bycatch management some of the tools that we use now or we have now for bycatch say of salmon and some other things, which I'll touch on. It's um, also been wouldn't wouldn't be possible under without this act, the way without the cooperatives helping things out. And um, kind of as a sidelight, while this was all happening, it also assuaged some of the concerns over stellar sea lion prey availability. And, and uh, it also made it so it was impossible to disentangle the effect of the American Fisheries Act and direct measures to uh, minimize, oops, minimize the recovery of stellar sea lions, impact of, minimize the recovery, it minimize the impact of uh, allowing a recovery. So now I'm going to just go a couple of slides to talk about some of the data that, that we have, what we use in our assessments, and, and what the fishery actually looks like out there. And these are the last three years of... Uh, basically the snapshot of where the fish are caught during the winter. So you'll see later on, I'll show you some ice edge pictures, but like just a couple of days ago, the fishery started up again in 2008, and it generally starts just north of Unimac Island, this island here, and extends out, and as, it, as the season progresses, they'll go further north and around the Pribilofs, and sometimes up into that canyon. Um, so pretty similar from one year to the next. You'll see lots of variability in terms of row production from one year to the next, but it's uh, um, not uh, fairly, fairly consistent. And the, here's the same thing showing the uh, movement or, or how the fish progresses. It's going on fortnight uh, increments here just on what, how much catch is being removed, showing the, the important part like right around this time of year. They're fairly concentrated right north of Unimac Island forming dense aggregations. And if you think back to those original slides, you can kind of make out that 100-meter um, contour where, where uh, pollock fishing doesn't seem to be as good in between those areas. In terms of uh, the catch, how it progresses each year, what this is is just the cumulative uh, catch in millions of tons as the, as the season progresses just for the winter. And so you can see, you know, in terms of when, when the AFA came into effect, you could see this really shift. It used to come up, the catch would, uh, it was a race for fish, so early in the season there were lots of boats fishing really hard, and the catches would come up fast pretty quickly and then uh, drop off in a different way. But uh, this is just one of the schemes to give you an idea of how much uh, variance there is from one year to the next and how the season works. Uh, extending into the summer months, um, what you see is a lot more up in the northwest region. And uh, in terms of stock structure, um, it's, the jury's still out to the degree that uh, the fish up here belong to separate spawning groups that are just in the, around the Pribilofs or from the main spawning group that's in Unimac. There's lots of advection. There's lots of movement. But uh, we're um, still trying to resolve some of these stock structure issues, which are hard to tease apart. 
But I would say also that um, these fish in the northwest area tend to be smaller, so they have a big impact on, uh, um, uh, or they tend to be the young fish. And, and the ones down in the southeast during the winter, during the summer, summer months tend to be older, larger fish. And so when you have a population, as you'll see in a minute, has high recruitment variability, so the, the population kind of swings back and forth from being pretty young, you know, less than five years old, to being, you know, relatively old. And especially if you have a, a group of poor recruitments or year classes in a row, this can be exas exacerbated. And, and that's what's happened this year is that, uh, that we've just had a, a, a swing away from a re relatively old group. And now a lot of the distribution and, and concentrations of pollock are more towards the northwest. And some of that shows up in the fact that the, the cumulative catch now for the summer summer months has dropped off quite a bit in last, in last year, and that has to do with the distribution being shifted more northwesterly. Um, moving into the assessment analysis, you know, we collect tons and tons of data, as well as tons of fish. We have an incredible observer program at the Alaska Center for Pollock. Um, a lot of our issues on sampling design are mute because we've got 200% observed. That's what we call it. We have two observers on most of the most of the boats and then 100% uh, observer coverage on boats greater than 125 feet. So pretty pretty extensive observer coverage, reliable data. Um, a, age and growth lab that's dedicated to aging something like 10,000 otolith structures per year, including the survey and observer data combined. And then uh, at least one survey here and, and then for the last couple of years, we've been fortunate to have two surveys specifically for Pollock that go into the model and provide advice to the council. We've also got biology, and it's great because I get to send my boss out to go collect samples. Um, it's in the Gulf, though, so it doesn't really count. But uh, um, one of the things with the, in the, on the biology side is that uh, we've been able to see with this extensive data collection is that uh, you can actually see how fish change their body size given length. So this is a really basic measure, how big they are and then how much they weigh. And you can see by month that uh, th these fish are actually getting skinnier in, from January to February. Then by March, they're at their skinniest, which is kind of the peak spawning time of year, so they're not feeding, they're moving a lot, they're getting to the spawning grounds. And then by mid-end of September, they're back up to uh, their fattest level. So this is just given the same length based on lots of, uh, uh, of samples, you get the fattest individuals. So you kind of, and there's other ways to show this, that it's quite interesting. In terms of how much survey effort we conduct, this is a sample of what took place in 2004, but it includes only the, the trawl surveys, and the, um, but with, a, with the slope region covered, the Aleutians were covered uh, with, a, with a survey that year, the number of hauls, but these points are our standard bottom trawl surveys, which all that data is available online at the center's site, so anybody that wants to do their own analysis can look at that as well. Um, this is this year's result, last year's result of an of a area swept expansion of uh, the bottom trawl surveys showing that where the densities occurred and in terms of CPUE and what it comes out to about 4 million tons of pollock on the bottom that was seen in this last year's survey. One of the things that affects this is that our survey, our survey area doesn't change from year to year, but the habitat changes quite a bit. You're talking about it's in the water column up in the, uh, a bit. And, but they respond to temperature changes. And looking at 2004 and 2005, for example, you see that the two degree isotherms well into the middle of the shelf and the, the four degree isotherms prevalent. And then the density of pollock shown here, yellow to red uh, gradation, so high pollock densities there, there. Now compare that with the last two years. First of all, you didn't see much pollock in 2006, but also you see this cold tongue, which really affected uh, the distribution of pollock and same in 2007. So, so just in terms of a survey, you have to kind of come up with ways to factor in the fact that your standard area, effective standard area might be changing. And we built that into the assessment model where you actually account for the effective temperature on the catchability of the stock, if you will. 
Um, this year we also got a, our new ship to work and we got little mosquitoes flying around. Um, it did this survey. Um, it's a really ugly boat, I think. It's so square, but I shouldn't say. It's all your fault. Um, anyway, this is, these are the transects that were conducted throughout uh, the Bering Sea and the Gulf. So these are not stopping, or these are the lines of uh, echo sign that they've seen. And this year they were able to extend into the Russian zone. Um, one of the things, just so you know, that uh, it involves each of these transects. When you see a spot of fish, you have to actually go back and see, well, what was it that you were seeing in the echo sign? And so this was a cool little uh, animation that uh, Tyna had that shows, well, here's an echogram. The idea is to go back and sample what was in that spot of fish and, and return it, take the lengths and convert that into biomass and come up with estimates that way. Really hard job, and these guys do a lot. I mean, it's a lot of work to get all this data together each year for an assessment. Um, and here's a, just an opportunity to have both surveys, the bottom trawl survey and the midwater survey on the same screen. And here's, this is 2006 year, summertime. And they overlap in time fairly closely. There, there are some places that are, you know, they're off by more, particularly at the ends of the surveys. But one of the things you could see is that here, for example, on the bottom, there was, didn't see many Pollock. But in the midwater column in that same area, they did find more Pollock. And that actually shows up in 2007 as well to some degree, that you get places where they didn't appear on the, on the, in the midwater. They actually occurred in the, in the, in the bottom trawl gear. So you, you see in that, it's just two maps laid on top of each other. Um, I just wanted to show the other years, because the Russian component of, of uh, the fishery, there's a fairly big fishery going on in Russia, and we try to take, into that, take that into account as much as we can. And these are the four years where the, the MACE program was able to either do collaborative studies with the Russian scientists themselves or have our ship go into their zone and, and examine the Pollock. And these are just a couple of years. I think this year was pretty interesting that as soon as they crossed the uh, convention line here, there was almost no Pollock um, seen right in the contiguous zone. So the Russian scientists said that that was just environmental factor, but I'm not so sure. Um, now, just looking at the time series, we've got the bottom trawl survey going back to 1982. This is just a smooth line fit through the, the biomass estimates for kind of perspective. We had almost 8 million tons seen in one survey, but fairly large confidence bounds there. And then uh, really low estimate in 2006, but it came up in 2007. This is about 87% of the long-term mean. so. Just keep that in mind for stock increase and decline. And this is kind of a smooth line, also just fit by eye, uh, through the hydroacoustic survey time series, showing a uh, pretty noisy, noisy pattern, just with kind of standard errors visited, uh, spe specified around that. The other thing that's really important in our assessments for the model is the age composition. As I said, the age and growth unit goes and collects age comps for Every year that we go do the survey, and this is just the whole time series of absolute abundance estimates uh, by year stacked up. And here you can see that uh, the 2006 year class, as seen in 2007, was almost as high as they've ever seen in that survey. Um, and the other thing you can do with these is to follow year classes, how they're observed through time. And I've just shaded a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of key ones and so you can kind of follow it. Here's the, I think this is the 92-year um, class where it showed up as one-year-olds but not twos, threes, and fours. And then it came on like gangbusters. They actually uh, increased at older ages. Um, so that was kind of an interesting pattern. But uh, these, are, these are real just data, no model fitting. But I think it's a really consistent, especially since this survey was really designed to survey crabs. It's not, it's not even a, a fish survey initially. Um, our more directed Pollock survey, this is the same data that doesn't go out every year. It used to go out every three years. Now it's going out more regularly. It's supposed to be on a biennial schedule, but um, we talked them into doing another survey this last year. And it also saw the 2006 year class as being 
one of the highest they've seen in the data. And so I want you to keep that in mind, obviously, that when you're thinking about where the results come in and, um, you know, with a declining stock, uh, that there's some positive signs in, in the outlook, and that's just further reflected here again, the age compositions from the two surveys. But so you put, take all this data, there's a whole suite of uh, fishery data that's done in a similar way, and uh, you cry, grind it through, and what you have here um, is just the mean value, and then uh, the actual recruitment estimates, taking all the data into account and the model structure, and some estimates of the precision. And, and one of the things you'll see is that the 06 year class shown here is quite large, but with fairly large confidence bound. So we, you know, got our fingers crossed. There could be a lot of mortality or other sources of a disappearance that we're not taking into account. But the real message here is that uh, there's almost five year classes in a row where it's been below average, which really hasn't happened in our, in our recent history, at least over this time series. So that's, that's going to cause a big decline in the stock. And, that's why one of the reasons why the quota has been knocked down so low. And here's the, here's the, the result of that climb. This is an index of uh, three plus biomass, you know, shown last year's model estimate. It's quite a bit higher, gone through and based on updating new data, showing why that, why that uh, change happened. But fairly steep decline and uh, kind of hoping not, not, as, not as low as we have seen ever, but uh, certainly low enough. In fact, at, at our, one of our meetings this year, fishermen stood up and said, I've been fishing since 1987, and this is the worst I've ever seen it. And they go, well, yeah, that's about right, you know. <laughs> um, so anyway, that, that's, uh, I'll get, touch some more on that in a second. But you know, applying this to uh, management advice, you take these assessments, and basically what it comes down to is, is where you are relative to where you want to be and, and what, what, how hard you should fish. Uh, kind of standard stock assessment theory, pop die theory says, well, if you fish at a rate that's sustainable, then it doesn't, you don't really need to change the rate. You should, on average, rebuild to that level. In Alaska, early on, we set the target so that once we didn't want to drop any further, we, we would actually decrease the rate. And in fact, for Pollock, we're, we're dropping below the, the BMSY levels in this year, and our rate is dropping, whereas before we didn't have any issues with the rate. Of course, when you're talking about a rate, you want to know about how that translates into an allowable catch. And so as the stock size decreases, and here we're conserving spawning biomass, the catch is actually starts to decline at the normal rate, but then once you drop below, it declines faster, obvious. But uh, still, that's an important point that, you know, this slide, I think, helped, especially in, in communicating to the council why things change fast in this, in this assessment. And I think that's something that uh, um, needs to be reiterated more, more often to, to the general public. Um, what actually happens is that we don't fish at these rates. Um, we don't actually fish at these rates when they're way up here because the stock's really big and it'd be like five million tons in some cases. So what, what actually happens is that we have this two million ton cap. Remember, the con single species assessment's just one tool, it's not the only tool. We have a two million ton cap, which effectively maxes out at Pollock, at least in recent years, at about 1.5 million. And so what actually happens, and this is just based on simulation, is that your harvest rate will start to be reached as the stock drops lower but in reality, when you're at these higher stock levels, because of that cap, your harvest rate's dropping off rather than staying the same. So you, you do get this uh, odd pattern, um, but it's still one that uh, is important to recognize. So we have this declining stock, and, and uh, one of the decision points was, you know, how worried should we be? Everybody's always worried. You know, we don't want things to go away. Gary calls me up in the middle of the night and says, oh, I think it's too high. <laughs> then he says, no, I think it's okay. No, it, it, seriously, when, it, the point is that because the stock's declining and the catches have stayed about the same, the exploitation rate on things that we think is important it has been increasing while the stock's going down. It's not a, it shouldn't be a big surprise. But now that we're reaching that uh, limit, the maximum, we actually have to really start ratcheting down the rate. 
because we want to make sure the stock stays above and at healthy levels. So these were two options that we presented that showed that if you fished at 1.2 million tons, you'd be dropping your rate from about 26% to about 24. And if you dropped it to 1.0 million tons, an even million tons, you'd be dropping the exploitation rate down to about 20%, which um, the council went with, and, and that was one of the factors that entered into the added adjustment. I should say it's an added adjustment because the standard rate would give you, based on risk aversion, almost 1.2 million. So 1.17 was the ABC recommendation, kind of maximum permissible, but then the council went and dropped the, the um, harvest level further so that uh, just out of concern for other issues. And here's just a list of things that uh, in the assessment why, why the uh, ABC dropped. Obviously the biomass was dropping, but there were other things in the data that across the board changed and this could be a, this was another aspect of the, the, the effect. So um, I'd just like to, that's kind of the assessment part and I'd like to just spend a few slides on talking about bycatch issues. Um, I said in the beginning that, you know, pollock fishery is a fairly clean fishery. I, I did this calculation, I was really surprised. It's only about 12 kilos of non-pollock fish per ton of pollock that you catch. So, you know, it's 1.2%. So it's a pretty small value of, of uh, you know, stuff that you don't want relative to what you do want. So it's a clean fishery. So it's something that's really important in that sense. But we have this other issue that uh, some things are more sacred than others, and, and salmon happens to be one of them. Um, and I just want to touch on some of these issues that we have. We do have management measures in place for salmon, and it's, um, even with these management measures, they're actually more proactive than we've ever been in trying to uh, avoid salmon bycatch. But that proactive characteristic, this is the, the time trend of the, the blue diamonds here is the chum salmon primarily. It's non-Chinook, but it's primarily chum. Uh, exceeded almost 700,000 tons back in 2005. Since then, it's come down. What did I say, tons? Yeah, that would be seven. Yeah, I'm used to saying that. <laughs> um, Seven hundred thousand fish. <laughs> it's that's a lot of fish, though. And and uh, the, the 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 concern here is that well, one one thing is that the Asian chum salmon production is quite high. Many in, in the room might know a lot more about that than I do. But uh, one of one option is that they think that a lot of these chum salmon are coming from Asia, from uh, hatcheries, but still it's an alarming rate and measures are, are being taken to avoid chum. But more important in terms of Alaska issues, I think, is that this incredible increase in Chinook rates shown on the right here. This year was over 120,000 ton fish taken by, <laughs> taken by the uh, Pollock fleet. There's actually more if you count all the other fisheries, but this is just the Pollock, Pollock fleet here. But uh, so, you know, that's a, that's a big concern. Well, guys, smart guys in the back of the room might be thinking, well, it's obvious the pollock catch is going down, or the abundance is going down, so they obviously have to fish harder, and that's why they're catching more salmon, is just because there's fewer pollock, they have to tow longer to catch a, 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 a ton of pollock. But, in fact, that was what the council was prepared to provide testimony on, that, oh, it must be that the Pollock fishermen are towing longer. That's why they, they have to um, be, have a different regulation for, for what they did, what they're doing. But um, what I did to try to look at this was I took the estimates of the total number of hours towed, you know, Pollock towing in the water, standardized it so it averages a value of one, and that's given by these pink dots here. And sure enough, you do see an increase in effort towing in the water uh, as the stock has gone down, not too surprising. But if you compare that to the standardization of, uh, of Chinook salmon catch, it's nowhere near. I mean, that's a threefold increase relative to the average um, in the last couple of years. So what's causing it? It's either there's, there's pretty much two answers, that there's a lot more Chinooks out there and uh, it's, we don't know where they're coming from, which is a whole other issue that uh, Jim Sieb would be helping tackle. 
uh, we don't know where they come from. They might be coming from uh, places that we're not estimating very well. Or there's just lots, lots more of them, obviously. The, the other alternative is that in the early period, maybe the Chinook hung out here and the Pollock were here, and they overlapped by 10% or so in terms of thinking just abundance. And now, for whatever reason, the overlap is much greater, and the same number of Chinook have become more vulnerable. That's kind of the doomsday scenario for you know, real impacts on salmon. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is ways to both analyze it to reduce the bycatch. We've taken uh, more environmental data looking at patterns in the, in, in the ocean that might reveal why the distributions have changed, if that's the case. But we have already looked at, and it's on the website for the Devon Seminar, um, some things like, well, are they towing at night more often? Are they towing at deeper depths more often? Kind of the obvious things. And you know, there isn't really an obvious change of smoking gun on how the fishery is being prosecuted um, that would explain the increase. So that's an issue. Uh, Alan Haney here is uh, also helping by looking at uh, creative ways of, of managing the bycatch. Uh, actually, we have a rolling hotspot closure that's in place now that I said at the beginning was something that the industry has been able to organize, and it's very effective. Uh, incidentally, you know, back in here, they weren't trying to avoid salmon at all. I mean, there was no measures whatsoever, and, and the catches were really low. Now they're doing lots and lots of work to uh, move out of high bycatch areas, and these are just some of the industry-sponsored uh, closers where they close themselves out because they caught too many salmon in these regions and fished elsewhere. So um, there's lots of work being done on that, that and, and some really interesting uh, solutions we hope to come up with in collaboration with the council. And I've got a couple of slides on just environmental and, and ecosystem stuff that projects that are going on. Uh, this slide I thought, you know, well, the big picture, stepping back, you know, how is the ecosystem changing and how might that affect Pollock? And uh, this is based on some work done by Franz Muter that showed uh, recruitment residuals compared to kind of a characteristic uh, system in which the ice retreated early, caused a late bloom, and uh, was favorable towards Pollock, and then compared that to a later ice retreat and an earlier ice edge bloom, and it converted things more benthic. In other words, is the energy focusing in the benthos, or is it being more up in the water column? And this is something that, you know, if, if we have a big regime change, this might be something that we could look at and actually plot and say, well, if it stays like this, you know, we should prepare for it and tighten our belts for Pollock. And so, to some degree, all of our flatfish stocks are already showing some of that happening. There's also a project being undertaken by um, Stephanie Zador, where um, she's starting to look at Arrowtooth and Pollock. This is some stuff I did a long time ago, but um, just showing the survey densities of Arrowtooth starting in 1982 compared to survey densities of Pollock on the right here. Here's the time series of Arrowtooth uh, CPUE in the survey, but I'm going to just walk through a couple of uh, four years at a time. 82, you can see relatively low levels of Arrowtooth. Um, sorry, now going 88 through 89. I'm sorry, 86 through 89. Starting to see a little more Arrowtooth in the region and almost overlapping a lot of times where, with where the Pollock are. And as that increases through time, you, you definitely see some incursions into kind of prime Pollock areas by the end of the uh, last couple of years here. So Arrowtooth is an issue. We know they're pretty fierce predators. Um, Stephanie's already done incredible stuff with uh, looking at these data in much more detail. And we're going to try to build this into a uh, predator-prey model uh, that we've already developed, but not with uh, spatial overlap and Arrowtooth uh, patterns explicit. But another thing that I'd like to just point out is that uh, you know, we talk about risk aversion a bit in, in our part of the world. And what, what is it? Why do we have it? Well, what it basically says is that uh, we have our ABC level is going to be set to the harmonic mean of the P PDF. And Grant Thompson's done a bunch of work to show that this is formally true. Um, I won't go into the details other than to say that the critical thing for you to know is that when you're more uncertain about what your harvest level should be, your target harvest level should be, 
your actual quota recommendation will, will go lower. That's what the harmonic mean says for, for that type of thing. So, you know, you've heard MSY is a bad paradigm. Estimation of FMSY should be avoided at all costs, but here we're emphasizing it's the estimate of the uncertainty in the MSY. That's important, and building that in provides a buffer so that uh, things will work out better. Well, what is causing some of the variability in FMSY? In other words, things that might affect the adjustment. Um, for Pollock, we have uh, time-varying selectivity, and that's something that's uh, obviously, if you're calculating FMSY, those of you that, that know about this, um, it matters what, what, the, what you assume about selectivity for the future, whatever time frame you're using. Also, there's things on growth. This is just tons of data, how variable average weighted age is by year in our fishery. So th there's that's going to be different in the future as well. I mean, there's natural variability. And obviously, stock recruitment relationships as well. So, so the answer to the question is that environmental effects, I maintain, affect our, uh, our policies directly and result in lower ABCs because we know uh, things our uncertain things end up with uh, higher levels of uncertainty. They, they go directly into our estimation procedure. Another thing that you can look at is um, the impact of regimes. You know, it's talked about, we talked about these uh, uh, shifting things that uh, Franz Muter has been doing. So we actually went through and looked at different, I'm just changing the brackets here, different sets of regimes. And if you plot them out, it's the impact of uh, of the average recruitment, so this is based on the long-term mean, 63, this was done in, uh, over a shorter time frame since those year classes are more well estimated, compared to early period, which had much lower average recruitment compared to the, the most recent period. So there's a pretty big jump at 77. Um, however, for any recent regime shifts, the, the jury's still out if we've seen anything moving away. And the reason that's important is because we depend on our tier one calculation of our, our estimate of stock recruitment. And if things have really changed, we want to be able to uh, take that into account in types of regimes. And one of the ways we can take that into account is doing management strategy evaluations. This is a, a baby one of, of these that we've done, uh, similar to what we've done in the past. But this is taking uh, projections out so we move away from, uh, we want to look at, I can evaluate production regimes and I can contrast among tiers. It's just a, a, a mini thing I did recently. And one of the things you can note is that the reason I'm showing this is this is the band of recruitment variability that we expect to see given this model configuration. And the different lines are actual realizations. And I wanted to show that, yeah, you still get these periods where you'll have several poor year classes lined up in a row. And that, I think there's only eight lines there, and you can see it happens. Stuff happens. But then, um, so in terms of management, we could manage and do scenarios where we evaluate fishing at the line here or fishing more like the dots with a cap. So I have some runs done with and without a cap. And so here's a, here's a, a trend in, again, realization shown over confidence bounds based on where we are now and where we might go. And you can see, yeah, it happens. That will drop. It can happen again. Um, or you can have, if you have no cap in harvest, it, it, the whole thing drops quite a bit. So if you were actually did fish with this huge variance in annual catch, which would be almost impossible in terms of harvesting capacity and energy to do, but uh, if you can do it in the simulation and show, yeah, it might not be so good to, to keep the stock down at lower levels. But it's also, here's the no cap in the range of spawning biomass uh, with, a, with the no cap, constant harvest rate kind of a thing, compared with the cap and, and with the under no fishing, just in terms of contrast in the range. And the two colors are just different productivity regimes or scenarios. And that just shows the spawning biomass. But also what you see is that the coefficient of variation in spawning biomass also drops depending on which policy you use. And you can see how different they are across, um, across different policies into the future. And one of the things that uh, you'll see a lot about is maternal effects. And, and uh, you know, well, our system of fishing is 
uh, definitely can't be correct because we're changing the age structure, modifying the genetics, and we don't ignore that, and we think that's important. We do tend to move it into the whole realm of, well, we have stock recruitment that we can evaluate to look at that. You know, we've had success of recruitments with, with things that we've actually seen and observed, so why should we expect things to change from, from what we've actually observed? And, and so um, we're still worried about that, but one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting with this is this is the average age of the mature stock, again, just for one year in the future, um, but over a thousand simulations. And what it shows is that under our current policy, kind of with a cap and a harvest rate, um, we're not extremely different than, I mean, we are different, obviously, than under a no fishing scenario, but, but still we do a lot better than a constant harvest rate scenario in terms of having a, a broad range of ages in the stock. And that's just kind of a heuristic way of looking into uh, the impacts of, of different uh, policies on age structure. And so um, I just wanted to wrap up with the uh, management strategy evaluations that, you know, we really need to, in anything we do for Bering C. Pollock anyway, is we account for retrospective biases that we've seen in our data. Um, and then we also want to, we make a, a set of decisions each year on how to specify the quota. And, and that really hasn't been entertained fully in a, in a management strategy context. So there's lots of, easily when Andre goes and does a management strategy evaluation, he's looking at all different kinds of policies, all different kinds of real world scenarios. Um, you know, in our, in our world, I think we need to do that. But in addition, I think we could go a long ways towards simple things like, well, should we average selectivity over the last three years, last 10 years, the whole time series, things like that. So those types of issues are, are important and, and need to be looked into um, in a management strategy evaluation context. Um, I just have a couple of slides on, on, uh, on the, the alarming level of uh, ice extent that we've seen in the North Pacific and in the Arctic. And um, just showing you that this is off of a website that's really, if you're interested in the changing uh, ice conditions in the, in the Arctic, this is an ex excellent place to start. But it shows that we've had our lowest ice extent for, since 1978, this last summer. And uh, this is a map of it. And I really like this perspective because I've seen a picture of my head in the picture. I always think, God, is that what it really looks like? You know? <laughs> Anyway, this is uh, Seattle, the Bering Sea, and the North Pacific as seen from the North Pole. And this is September 15th back in 87. And I'm just going to show 97, 10 years later, this is the density of ice. The more pink it is, the darker pink, the thicker the ice. And this is now 2003, and I'll just go by 04, 05, 06. You can see it's quite a bit less. And here's that record low in 07, the ice cover. So this is last summer in, in, the, in the Bering Sea, I mean the Arctic Ocean. So one of the things that's important for our fishery is, well, uh, the ice extent does matter quite a bit. And so now we've jumped forward to uh, the middle of January, and now just focusing on this area, the incursion of ice that we see. And I just want to go through the last three years to see if, if uh, this is 2006, 2007. Now this year, do you think it's going to be, given that September thing, uh, as scary as the, that one was. Well, it turns out our winter ice was able to rebuild and it actually looks fairly similar to what we've seen over the last few years. So just going backwards, 06, 07, 07, and 08. So still some ice, it's, it's much thinner than it was, but it's still, uh, it's developed. And, and since then I've actually gone and uh, updated this. This is uh, based up on some other stuff. So it's actually moving forward in time and you can see it's getting thicker and up until uh, yesterday, whoops, oh, I guess I didn't get yesterday in there. But uh, yeah, so the, the, the amount of ice seems to be back to what we expect at this time of year, which I find, uh, see as a good thing. Um, anyway, my concluding remarks is that uh, I think uh, data is like beer. It's really good. Um, shouldn't be abused. And uh, this was a, my funny slide on... on how I think the irony of how hard it is to open the can of maintaining sustainable fisheries has gotten easier because lots of tools and computational software has made it easier. Um, 
and uh, I think that's uh, all I have. Well, we've got a couple of minutes for questions because I, we need to lubricate this man's uh, throat before he expires on us, but there's time for a couple of questions. Yeah, so, Jim. Uh, you have a very nice set of formulae that, that tell you how much you're, you're going to allow me to take the experience. The last two years, the plan team, the authors of the plan, have suggested less than the maximum allowable. What are the decision criteria that you use to decide to go below what the uh, model says? How do you take those other environmental issues into account? I, I, I'm assuming that was quite loud. Everybody hear the question? Nobody wants to repeat it. Um, I, the, the, the question was, how do you basically, how do you, what are your decision points on how much you should lower an ABC from based on any formula? Is it, there's, there's been, I think, are you referring to the three sets of numbers that the plan team put forward or just the two? I'm thinking in particular, the last two years, when we've come up with, ABCs, the plan team has suggested lower than the formula would have initially allowed. So we cut the allowable catch by a couple hundred thousand tons. Well, I, th I think the argument was made at the plan team, and I think they, they thought the same, was that, uh, um, that the reason you would drop below kind of the formulaic version was that, well, Let's not increase the harvest rate anymore. You know, you got this issue that you're coming up against a, uh, a rate now that has to be adhered to, whereas before you weren't effectively. And so, so the question is, you, during that transcendence, you're actually increasing the harvest rate while the stock is declining upwards of 20% per year. And so it was more just that let's hold things steady. Let's not increase the harvest rate. And, and, and any further than, than uh, where it was, at least in the recent years. And now that we're up against that rate, we're having to lower it even more than just a level. So, so two years ago, we recommended keeping it level, and the SSC went with it a little bit higher than that. And, and this year, as a result of that, we've actually had to drop it a little bit further. So, so you're at that edge where the rates actually has to be adhered to, and it's changing a lot faster. The question is, what, what, what's the impact, what is the possible impact on uh, the, the restriction in, in area of, of fishing relative to endangered salmon? Something like is that. So, so um, first of all, to date, I don't think we've had any uh, samples from, of salmon that were found to be from an endangered stock. So it, it does raise a really important and scary issue, though, because that would require uh, special consultation, Section 7 consultation, and, and raise, raise the specter of that whole issue a lot higher. So, yeah, it would do more than just close areas. It would sh shut down the fishery, I think, at least uh, in the near term, if, if it was found that that salmon bycatch was from endangered stocks. Okay, one last question. Looks like everybody needs that beer. Let's give another round of applause.